Hey, it's Erin. Gaining muscle while simultaneously losing fat. Is it possible? Well, today we're going to find out. I'll be talking with Dr. Scott Stevenson, who I like to call the wizard of muscle building. He's also the author of Fortitude Training, and he imparts such knowledge and really explains things in such a way that makes it easy to understand. The video itself is amazing. The sound quality, not so much. We were kind of talking in a big echoey room, but I hope you can look past it and glean some really great information from it. Thanks for watching. Hey, it's Erin, and we're here at MI40 Gym. I've got a special guest with me, Dr. Scott Stevenson. I know Scott rather well, but for many of you who don't know who he is, he is a muscle building wizard. Tell, tell everybody about yourself. About yourself. Well, I went to wizardry school back in the 1700s. No, no wizardry school. Um, I did go to school for quite a long while. So basically I am sort of, I grew up kind of as a meathead reading Muscle and Fitness and Flex magazine and I've been lucky enough to be able to follow my passion um, as a bodybuilder and I found that I really like to educate. That's why you find me here now. So along the way, I went, to, I went to college and eventually figured out I wanted to become the world's greatest personal trainer, which led me to become an exercise physiologist and eventually college professor. So I'm a PhD in exercise physiology and I've sort of focused on muscle biology, muscle physiology. I'm actually also a licensed acupuncturist. I've written a couple books. My training system is called Fortitude Training and my, uh, my brain dump book is called Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach. BYOBBcoach.com, which uh, I've sort of introduced as a way for people to basically be their own Buddha, so to speak, and guide their own path through the bodybuilding world if they so choose rather than be reliant upon a coach. I think there's a need for that alternative, especially nowadays. And um, so I'm just someone who's just lucky and fortunate enough to be, uh, be able to help people um, and get paid barely enough in doing so to, uh, to keep, the, keep the ride going. So that's me in a nutshell. We're gonna talk today about gaining muscle and losing fat. Is it possible? Let's find out. Okay, so this is, as I put, it's right here behind Aaron, the holy grail. This is sort of the basis that you'll see literally across the entire health and fitness marketplace. People want to do those two things simultaneously. That's the transformation that you see in all these special transformation before and after pictures. And it is indeed possible to do that under very special circumstances. Um, and I've gone through these here, we'll cover those first and foremost, but the thing that people I think need to keep in mind is that those are those special circumstances where it definitely is possible, but generally speaking, for most people, having one goal in mind makes a lot more sense, and I'll explain to you why here. Gaining muscle is a process, which everyone wants to do, of course. This is highly energetically expensive. It, it takes a lot of caloric intake in order to gain the muscle. Of course, the training has to be in place. So there needs to be a caloric excess here. You might have a hard time reading this, but you gotta have enough protein too. And this is a whole other, whole other topic that we go into about a gram per pound per day. We'll save that for another video. Losing body fat is the other side of this coin. This requires some sort of a caloric deficit. So basically what this means, it's a fancy term, this means that your caloric intake is less than your caloric expenditure and the difference in those calories ideally is coming from body fat. So you're still not violating any laws of thermodynamics here. You're still not like breaking the rules of the universe. You're instead deriving those calories that you need from your body fat stores, ideally not the muscle mass. You wanna hold on to that with your training, resistance training for the most part. So these two things both would involve resistance training. Obviously gaining muscle resistance training is a great way to do that. It's a great way to hold on to muscle while you're losing body fat. Gain the muscle, you're trying to accrue muscle mass. You need a caloric excess for the most part here. With enough protein, caloric deficit for losing fat. Actually, you may even need more protein when you're dieting down. This has an anti-catabolic effect. Some really, really cool research now that's come out. Um, Stu Phillips has done some of that, for instance, where they're gone like up to, up to even two grams per pound per day. So pretty high, pretty high amounts. So, 
the holy grail here. Can you gain muscle and lose fat at the same time? Can you go forwards and go backwards simultaneously without ripping yourself in some sort of a wormhole of violation of thermodynamic principles of the universe? Um, yes, that can happen. And Erin actually tells me that she actually does this in those certain circumstances when she goes from her very lackadaisical off-season approach, right? Not. <laughs> no. <laughs> when she changes from sort of an off-season, less structured approach to when you're really hitting the hitting it hard. Yeah. Prep, so prep I mean, wise. it would be training six days a week, doing sprints twice a week, um, a lot of compound movements, a lot of heavy lifting, and then of course macronutrient timing. So that is perfectly timing the meals to allow for gaining muscle and then running a deficit at times when I'm more sedentary. So, I mean, it's kind of like the perfect storm and then also having the genetics right. and then also the uh, intensity level because being a former collegiate athlete, I can push myself. So, I think I might be an outlier. No, it, no, it's actually possible, but you are an outlier. That, we're not gonna argue that point, I think. But, but you also, you're an outlier in terms of probably genetics, but also how hard you can train. And that's an outlier lifestyle. Most people listening to this can't do that because they're not a professional athlete the way that you are now. So, but the thing about that that's really interesting is you're, before that, before you went through the two a days and all the things you just mentioned, you were still doing a pretty, you know, pretty substantial uh, training regime. Yeah. But what you did was a whole quantum leap forward in terms of the stimulus and the change in diet and everything else. And not that you were had a monstrous amount of body fat before that, but you you were probably at your highest level of body fat most of the time. Yeah. For you at least, which isn't very much. Like thirteen going from thirteen percent to right. let's say like six or seven percent. So it was still And that's a tremendous effort. Yeah. Right? So that is analogous to what will happen when you see people in these pre and post videos or pictures where someone has been not following a diet or maybe they're following a seafood diet where if they see the food they eat it, burgers, fries, what have you, they're not exercising very regularly. So they're sedentary with a poor um, standard American diet, SAD, with, and the acronym SAD applies here. Um, and then they go hog wild on whatever training program they've done. They've literally completely created a very novel stimulus here in terms of both training and diet. That's when that can definitely happen. Um, one of the best documented research pieces comes from when they do Army Ranger training. And those guys a lot of times will be in pretty good shape, but when they go into Army Ranger training, they'll just, they're basically trying to get these guys battle-proof to handle pretty much this type of scenario where you're when you're in another country and you've got minimal food and you're having to just exercise and literally barely, try to survive, those guys will sometimes gain a few pounds of muscle mass and lose a tremendous amount of body fat. That's definitely possible. So that's a scenario when it can happen. <clears throat> There's even some more um, really impressive, and I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm an animal lover. I have three dogs and they're, they're my family. But there's some animal research that they can do where they will, it's called a compensatory overload. So they basically remove one of the calf muscles, like the gastrocnemius or the soleus, one or the other, they've done in various ways. And they look at the remaining muscle as the animals walk around and regain normal activity. And that remaining muscle will grow like crazy because it's, it's a huge increase in its training stimulus going from basically losing maybe half the muscle mass of the calf, the other muscle has to compensate, and it does so by hypertrophy. You can actually see that happen when those animals aren't given any food. It will still happen. You can actually remove testosterone from those animals. You can remove insulin from those animals. You can take out the pituitary from them. So they've got no growth hormone, they've got no thyroid, they've got nothing, that muscle will still grow. And it's not happening magically, it's because the stimulus is so intense and the protein from the other muscles is, is being released as they're broken down in this starvation scenario and then taken up in that muscle mass. So, that, so it's possible to increase muscle mass in the worst case scenarios. Now, of course, you would never do that, but that's sort of a very isolated scientific uh, um, sort of microscope into what muscle can do when it's really exposed to tremendous overload type of stimulus. So 
novel stimulus, you can gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. So if you've done what Erin has done, where she just ups the ante, or if you're a newbie to training, um, or you're increasing your training and diet effort substantially, and of course there's pharmacology too. That'll happen with bodybuilders who use a lot of PEDs and they can grow into a show, so to speak. So this can happen. So the question is, are you a newbie to training? Are you Aaron Stern, you're going from your off season, slacking off, not, to oh my gosh, I'm going for the gusto, I'm trying to become the absolute best in the world. Do you fit into any of these different scenarios here? So these are the types of things where this can actually happen. But for most people, these are the same things you're gonna do whether you're trying to gain muscle or lose fat. What you're gonna do is focus on one or the other. If you wanna gain muscle mass, for instance, if you're very skinny, and sometimes this holds for women too. There's some women who are just really, really rail thin and they wanna gain muscle mass Body fat's not an issue for them. So what would you recommend? Yes, so if, if, so if someone is skinny or if someone wants to lean down, would you recommend them first gaining muscle because that's going to increase their metabolism and then losing fat? Or would you recommend them just to get to like a certain level of body fat and then try to do like a clean bulk? Most people are gonna want body fat loss. Mm -hmm. Like that's most scenarios. If someone, if someone, I would say pick one, one of the two, and the nice thing is, in both cases, you're gonna do a lot of the same things. You're still gonna train hard. But what's easier? Is it easier to gain muscle first and then lose fat? Oh, that depends on the person. Yeah. So some people can't gain muscle to save their, save their lives. And this there's interesting, there's a, a set of studies that were done up in Canada where they took twins, they sequestered them in a clinic. And one of the studies, they overfed them. They figured out what their baseline caloric intake was. Mm -hmm. And then they said, okay, you're gonna eat a thousand calories a day beyond that, six out of seven days a week for about three months. That's a lot, that's being full. Mm -hmm. And the other set of studies, different twins, some fraternal, some identical. So some the genes were very similar, fraternal like brother and sister, mm -hmm. um, but the identical genes were the same. They said, okay, we're gonna cut your calories back from that maintenance level. We're going to make you do 500 calories worth of exercise on a cycler gumper. So they quantified it, okay. and there was no cheating. There was like no sneaking in Snickers bars yeah. from the outside. Like, you know, there was no like stuff people were handing you know cupcakes through the window. Mm -hmm. It was all completely controlled. So you would think, right? Every, it's good. Everyone's with the same amount of body fat. I wouldn't think because um, you've got the gut biome, and then you also have meat. So. I mean, you've right. got some things that... Yes, there's all sorts of things that can happen there. And some of that is going to be genetics. Mm -hmm. And the genetics is determine your need, too. If you, if you know some twins, there's some, some people are just kind of like, yeah, I just assume sit around and work the clicker all day long. And some people can't sit still for more than five seconds. Mm -hmm. That's neat, right? And microbiomes variations, too. There's a whole bunch of things. So what they found is like about a threefold range in the overfeeding study and in the underfeeding study and how much weight was gained or lost respectively all over the place so like you look at the twins like one twin pair identical twin pair they might have gained like 10 or 12 pounds mm -hmm. another twin twin pair 15 20 25 pounds and so if everything was if the meat was the same the bio was my was the same and the genetics were the same it's the same calories right yeah but it wasn't the same so, so yes I wonder, is there like a baseline that you could go by? You say a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Um, when someone's trying to gain muscle, should they focus on a certain percentage of carbs and a certain percentage of fats? Let's try to break it down and make it. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing that you get, first of all, from that, from that the set of studies, is that some people gain weight easily, mm -hmm. some people won't. So that's the hard thing. So some, some people, I mean, I've had clients that, people that are, relatively light and they're eating five six thousand calories a day and they're not gaining any weight so some people some people they would just be they'd be rolling through the doors at that they would be they'd be so big because that, that would be a tremendous excess for them so it will depend on the person and how they respond let's say in the case of trying to gain to the increments in their and this is where increments in their diet. So this is where you have to like watch as things go on. Some per, some people, and I've had clients like this too, you add 300 calories a day, 
So that's, that's not very much over the course of a week, and that gets them gaining really, really rapidly. And then you pay attention to how fast is the muscle coming on versus the fat, and then you have to subjectively say, okay, is this too fast for me, or is this too much, or, or is it too slow? Like some people are like, I don't care, I just want to get as, with guys, I just want to be as big as possible. Give me all the muscle mass, I don't care how fat I get, it doesn't matter to them. Women are like, no, 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 I'm, I don't want to get hardly any extra body fat. I want to just be as much muscle as possible. So you have to go more slowly in that case. Now when you say you add calories, do you add protein and carbs or do you add like a blend? How does that That's usually good. work? There's a lot of this. <laughs> now this will be bring it to all sorts of different videos, but this gram per pound is a place to stay. Mm -hmm. You can eat as much, almost as much protein as you possibly could and you will not gain any body fat. I've, I've tried this. Yes, yeah, I've eaten yeah. up to like four grams of protein per pound of body weight and I just, I feel like my metabolism yes. is the like thermal effect of food, right? Like mm -hmm. metabolism is going, I'm like sweating and yes. how possible is it, because I, I hear, get the question of converting protein to body fat is a very, very, like I mean, it, can it be done? It could, obviously it can be done, but yeah. the, the best set of studies were done by Jose Antonio. Mm -hmm. Just here, you, you probably know yeah. Joey, yeah, yeah. So, and they went up to like, or like 3.4 and like 4.3 mm -hmm. grams per kilogram, so above two, mm -hmm. um, and, and no impact on muscle mass or body fat, nothing. It basically just got burnt off, essentially. I mean, if you, if you were just like, like infusing someone with amino acids constantly, or they were eating like, you know, eight grams per pound, eventually you, you would have to or your kidneys would be like, oh. Yeah, your, kidney, your, your GI would probably give out before your kidneys, yeah. I would imagine, it would just be awful. So that can be a problem. Here's the other thing is they did a peanut butter study. And <laughs> Sign they, me up for that. Yeah, well, it was all, <laughs> they had gains, it was all body fat. Okay. Even though peanut butters, people say, I, you know, I'm using peanut butter as my protein source. No, it's not a great protein. There's some protein in there. It's not really a complete protein. But when they added protein, I forget how, or peanut butter, I forget how much the calories were, but basically they could vary. They did a pretty good job of accounting the excess calories from peanut butter, went right to body fat. It was basically a one-to-one, 100% -one, conversion. Peanut butter calories go to body fat calories. And that fits with the thermic effect of feeding too. Because um, fat has a very, very low, yeah, thermic effect of feeding. Carbohydrate burns off much more readily and, and protein much more than that. So we're talking like 3%, something like that for fat. It's like eight to 10 or like eight, seven or eight, I think for carbs, and then over 20% for, for protein, in terms of the caloric, the calories that are expended um, in just digesting and assimilating those different macros. So when you're trying to gain, you would just um, recommend adding, let's say like 200 calories uh, per day and do it like for a week or two and just kind of see? See what happens. Yeah. Some people will, they'll have a little bit of a metabolic adaptation. They'll also have that neat effect. Yeah, so they start fidgeting. They and start fidgeting around, around yeah. moving around. I mean, some people will know um, that they're eating more and it'll consciously affect things. Maybe they'll get more energized too. Yeah, the workouts better. will be better. Yep. The workouts will be better. They might be able to increase their training volume mm -hmm. and they're more active during the day and then they'll burn that off. So they might have to like move things up pretty rapid. It's a titration was the word I was going to say before. Literally you'll have to titrate based on what you see in the gym. And you can use body comp. You can mm -hmm. use, obviously you can use scale weight. You can use, which isn't the best one. Mm -hmm. You can use some pictures, like skin folds, some pictures, strength in the gym. Strength in the gym will be a really good indicator of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. um, skin folds, the way I do it with, with people is pick the spots where you hold the fat and pinch them. You don't have to get an estimate, like you don't have to say it's gonna be, you know, okay, my estimated body fat percentage is 21% or 19 or 30 or seven. Just look at those numbers. How big the pinches are. And how big the pinches are going. <laughs> and then, the, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we can break it down and be really scientific, but we are creatures of immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is really all about looking good. It's how you feel in the body that you're creating and people will self-limit. And I see this all the time. It's like, okay, everything's going good. And then the, the jeans are getting a little tight and like, yeah, I don't want to buy <laughs> new <freak> jeans. <laughs> even, even subconsciously, yeah. they will start doing things, um, I mean, subconsciously to increase caloric expenditure. Or they won't eat, those, eat that food or like they'll just, there's a little bit left in the plate and they'll just you know, put it in the dishwasher, they'll clean it off, things they don't know, and they'll just, they'll just stop making gains.
Or, I mean, I, of course, sometimes people will just start doing extra cardio, yeah. thinking that that will, it's like, okay, now you're undoing the food, you're, you're, you're basically, you're counting your own actions in terms of your food, so you gotta be honest with yourself, mm -hmm. you know, as far as that goes, and what you can do then, thinking big picture, is gain until you get to that uncomfortable zone, mm -hmm. and say, okay, I'm here, I've gained some body fat with my caloric excess, now I'm gonna hold the muscle, diet down, keep the muscle, lose the fat, until now I feel like, and, but don't be a yo-yo, or like, this, this should be more than like a three day process between yeah. back and forth. So how long would you recommend going at, for gaining muscle? At least a couple months before you're gonna see anything. You know, I, I, bodybuilders would do it on a yearly cycle because they're, they're gonna be competing once a year, roughly, or a competition season and off season. So, but yeah, at least at least two or three months at a bare minimum, because you're not going to accrue any gains or lose any substantial fat. So, you know, that might be like a range of, you know, what could be 15 pounds for some people, depending on how big you are. Mm -hmm. But you have to like put your mind to a certain amount, but then be reasonable with yourself. Mm -hmm. Having a good coach, having someone say, you know, you look fine, yeah. and. You know, body dysmorphia is, we all have a little bit of it. I mean, yeah. look at us, we've got, obviously got, the average person, they obviously have body dysmorphia, look at them, right? Right. So we do, so you, but you want, so you have to keep that in mind, be reasonable with yourself. But those are, those are really good questions. We've talked a little bit about, we've talked a lot about <laughs> gaining muscle. Yes. Now we're going to talk about how to lose fat and how to reveal that masterpiece that you've been working on. So, keep it simple, silly. Keep it simple, silly is nice it applies here basically you're training hard you're training in a progressive overload fashion here when you're trying to gain muscle you're not going to be able to gain in terms of strength in the same way when you've got this caloric deficit in place but you're still going to train with the same things in mind the thing that's going to happen is your recovery is going to be less so you're still training in a way that that in the same way you would to put on muscle you just can't and you have to train smart which means you train relative to your recovery level what I uh, like to say, and I take this from a friend of mine, Dante Trudell, um, he used to say it, I say it in my, one of my books, Dance with One Who Brung Ya, is if you trained with heavy weights and hard, and that's what led you to gain your muscle, stick with that some semblance of that same training approach when you're trying to lose fat. You're dancing with the one who brung you the muscle, so keep dancing with that person so you can keep the muscle and just change your diet potentially do cardio if you need to. I'm a big fan of cardio. That's another topic we can cover. So, but you can't obviously make gigantic gains in strength, so you'll have to be smart about it and perhaps vary your exercises more often. You'll plateau um, more frequently. Your volume will be less, but still train hard and of course safe. Don't try to do singles and doubles and triples when your calories are really, really low. Don't ask for injury in the gym but train as best you possibly can with whatever training regime and strategy you use to gain the muscle and just adjust the diet so that you've got this, this has to be in place for that caloric deficit to happen, for the fat loss to happen, you have to have the caloric deficit in place. So would you so. recommend lifting heavy, like if you've lifted heavy gaining muscle, you wanna lift heavy losing fat, what about sets and reps? Because I know a lot of people when they go to lose fat, they all of a sudden decrease the amount of weight and then they're upping the reps and they're doing like 20, 30 reps of you know, any given exercise. Yeah. What does that do to like stress cortisol levels? Like it, it's, it doesn't fit with the dance with one, one, dance with one who brung you mm -hmm. idea. Um, actually, there's a little bit of literature when, they, when you look at like circuit training, which is what that kind of approach is, mm -hmm. where it literally you try to weight train with the idea of expending as much energy as you can you don't really get very high in terms of your caloric expenditure. It's only like 55, 60% of VO2 max, which is, and that's in the gym going all out. That's probably at or maybe even below what you do if you're doing cardio. So your energy expenditure isn't very high, but you, what you're losing out on is the heavy loading, the tension, and the things that put on that muscle mass. So you can ask yourself that question, or the question, would you train that way to gain muscle mass? No. So what people are doing there is trying to use the weight training as a way to expend calories. It's cardio, <laughs> yeah. and it's not a very good form of cardio. The, the data is there. Mike Stone did this research a while ago. It's the study I'm thinking about. So you can do cardio, which I'm not a big big fan of, 
um, or do increase your need, which I am a huge fan of. Mm -hmm. I work on my Jeep, I walk my dogs, I do stuff around my house, all those sorts of, I do fun things. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's interesting, like when I, when I diet down, I end up doing like becoming more active and doing more fun things. If you're a woman who likes to shop, go to the mall and window shop. Yeah. Like do the things that get you out and get you active. Bowling with friends where you're getting up and moving around. Those things which you tend not to do are a great way to expend more energy. Keeps your um, mind off of eating too. Absolutely, keeps you occupied. Yeah. Otherwise you're just sitting at home thinking, I can't wait till my next meal, I'm so hungry. Mm -hmm. It's not good, that doesn't help. When I've got a project, my mind gets totally focused on that. Mm -hmm. So, expending the calories one way or another, but not with not by sacrificing that that essential stimulus that got you the muscle. Okay. This is just what I've learned over the course of, of decades of doing this. And in dieting, yes. so I mean, obviously the metabolism is elastic, and when the body realizes that you're decreasing calories, it, it can tend to slow down. What mm -hmm. What would you do to keep that from happening? Would you do calorie cycling where you eat more one day and then eat less the next day, kind of thing? Or yeah. Um, there's some there. There's a, a small but a growing body of literature suggesting like that what bodybuilders are doing forever, like refeeds. Mm -hmm. um, Someone's called cheat meals. Um, some caloric cycling and people who do carb cycling, it does seem to work. Mm -hmm. um, and this could be they've done they've done strange things like like two days every 11 days, like 11 days of dieting. That's what I heard days. 11 days. That yeah. was one of the studies. Was mm -hmm. 11 days like. What? It doesn't fit with anything, but mm -hmm. like we have a seven-day week. There's really nothing. I mean, there, we have tw we have four weeks and a lunar cycle in a sense that fit with menstrual cycles. So that's kind of the biological mm -hmm. connection. But otherwise, like seven days, is just sort of the way our calendar's been set up. Um, it's nothing specific, mm -hmm. really, necessarily how our bodies work. So you could do a cycling of your diet on any particular cycle that works for you. Seven days just seems to work better. Um, people do cyclical ketogenic diets that way. Um, that can work really well. I actually am a fan of CKDs for people who are weight training who want to lose fat or a targeted ketogenic diet where you add those calories. So um, that does seem to help. The data are really suggesting it does seem to You wouldn't think like how could that possibly happen, um, but it does. Mm -hmm. And some of it is probably, I'm guessing, I haven't seen this explored directly related to NEAT. Mm -hmm. um, some of it could be related to things even like as subtle as maybe cortisol. Like when you know it's like, Okay, it's Tuesday. I get to eat on Friday. That's the thing. I got. To, I can diet for three days. Yeah. I can do that. But it's like it's Tuesday, and I get to eat in October. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's that's so not good. Like, this is stressful. This is awful. Mm -hmm. That tends to cause all sorts of things. Like you'll break your diet. You'll have mm -hmm. adherence issues. Those sorts of things. Um, there's also the carving up that comes with that, mm -hmm. which means more glycogen in the muscle means you can train harder. If you can train harder, you have a better stimulus for holding the muscle. And if you can hold the muscle mass, that's going to help actually make you look better in general, but it's help with your metabolism too. Cool. It'll push you feel better. Yeah. So when yeah. you decrease your calories, you would recommend keeping your protein high and maybe just kind of manipulating the carbs and the fats? Or yeah. In fact, the protein can go up. Okay. It can even go higher. This is what this, I mentioned to Phillips earlier in the video. Um, yeah. He's, he's done some, there's some other studies that are coming out now. Higher is better. And yeah, actually, those one of those studies. They sh this was, in, I think, untrained people. It's a very short study. The one I'm thinking of. It's only four weeks, but there was an increase in fat-free mass with the high protein. And that was novel stimulus. Mm -hmm. These sorts of this sort of scenario, but that can be done. Um, then you have to look at the, as far as whether you drop fat or carbs. You want to have enough carbs so that you're able to maintain glycogen for your training. Mm -hmm. So that would be a matter of. What kind of training are you doing? Are you a high volume trainer where you need those carbs or are you doing like sort of a high intensity regime where you're doing like one or two sets and you don't have a glycogen need so much for performance in the gym? In that case, you could bring your carbs down. You still want to refeed though with some carbs. Um, there's reasons for filling up the muscle, volumizing the muscle. Um, you can imagine if you've got a muscle, just, just think sort of teleological here from the perspective of a muscle cell is like, so am I gonna be anabolic when I don't have any glycogen around? No, I'm all shrunken down, I'm small, I'm like, no, this isn't a good thing. So you wanna have some glycogen there, and so you wanna refeed at least periodically enough. I don't suggest people would train more than twice without having some sort of a glycogen refilling, even if they're like on a ketogenic diet. But um, if you're eating like a Pritikin style, like low fat mm -hmm. diet, which 
a lot of women do really well mm -hmm. with, well then you don't have any fat to cut out, so you're gonna have to drop your carbs. So that question answers itself pretty much. So the question, uh, another question I get with carb intake is if someone is planning, let's say like a heavy leg day, they're running a caloric deficit, they're trying to lose fat, do they carb up the day before the heavy leg day or do they carb up the day of the heavy leg day, let's say they're training at like noon? That's right. So some people feel good, like especially people who do well on a ketogenic diet because of the mental clarity, mm -hmm. when they take in the carbs, they get sluggish. So, I mean, and if you, if you like done like a carb up for a show, yeah. you're like two or three meals in, you're like, you're hungry and you, wanna, you just want to sleep and eat, yeah. like there's nothing else. Yeah. You don't want to go train, that's it. Yeah. That's not a good time. That, so that carving up early on is probably not going to be the best choice for someone mm -hmm. who has that experience. Whereas uh, someone who doesn't, like they could probably start with an intra workout, get their workout going, get moving, have some carbs in an intra workout drink and then carb up afterwards. Okay. And then you'll be able to refill those. And of course you sensitize the muscle with the training too. Mm -hmm. And you're refilling the glycogen thereafter. So it'll be full as long as you don't train or do much opposing or cardio what have you, that muscle's glycogen will remain for probably five to seven days. Okay. Um, as long as you don't use it up somehow. Yeah. So yeah, but some people they're like, uh, I mean, I, you hear this, it's like, you know, I'm, I even heard guys like they're on a video, it's like, you know, I'm training and I've only had one meal today. And, and it's like, so that's the reason why my weights are low or I don't, if you don't see like this tremendous performance in the gym, it's because I only had one meal and I train fasted all the time mm -hmm. and I don't, it doesn't bother me one bit, but I'm used to that and that's me. So some people would be better off having a big food day beforehand mm -hmm. so that they feel full and ready and like kind of fuel it up, so to speak, at least psychologically and then they can hit it hard. That's a good, like, this is a side topic, but as far as gaining muscle and safe legs, mm -hmm. is, a, is a something you really want to grow? You could structure your diet. Um, actually, this fits with the diet, too. So let's say someone has, um, they want to keep their leg mass. It's a woman who wants to keep leg mass more than anything. Upper body doesn't matter so much. And they've got a period of the week when they're going to refeed and add calories. The rest of the week is really kind of deficit devoted. That would be the time the day before, add the food then and the day of the leg training. Or maybe the day of the leg training and the next day. Mm -hmm. So they've really sequenced that food. This is a global sort of nutrient timing um, approach. So the food is put in place around that training so that you've got recovery and support for the training of the muscle that you really want to hold on to, the muscle mass the best with. So, and the rest of the time it's like, ah, I don't care about my biceps or my back, or whatever. Right. So I can, you know, I can be in a deficit and sacrifice that muscle, but I'm gonna make sure that my legs have plenty of fuel for the training and plenty of recovery energy for rebuilding after the training session. Cool. So that's a good question though. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense, and people ask that all the time. And so, yeah. just like with losing fat, I guess it's not possible to spot reduce, um, but kind of what you're saying with the keeping muscle, it's possible to really feed the body and maintain muscle in certain areas. Yeah, you can you can preferentially hold on to muscle mass to a certain degree if you if you sequence your diet in that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean you just imagine that some of these are very subtle things. You can imagine, let's say that no one would ever do this, but let's say you take in an average of let's just say it's a thousand calories a day. So you have seven thousand calories in the course of the week. And let's say you eat all seven thousand calories on the weekend, and that's when you do your leg training. It's 500 calories in and afterwards, and all your other training happens the other days. Those other days happen in the background of complete starvation. That muscle, you would expect that muscle mass is not gonna do very well. Whereas the leg training muscle mass would probably do better. It's got all the calories around it. Everything's, the whole training is set up around, you can train harder because you've got the food in you, you feel better. Those other days would be awful. That's an extreme, you'd never do that of course, but the, conceptually that gets the idea across that the timing can make a difference. This is just what I've seen. So. Cool. Yeah. We didn't cover hardly anything. We felt like we just like scratched, scratched the surface here. Well, there's so much. I, th I yeah. think we went over a good overview and yes. it kind of opens the door for a lot of specific questions and then we right. can do some more videos in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you guys have specific questions, let us know in the comments below and we'll do separate videos for those. Um, but the key takeaways are, if you want to gain muscle, you have to be in a caloric excess. And if you want to lose fat, you have to be in a caloric deficit. So you can't ride two horses with one, but you gotta choose one and stick with it and then switch gears and go to the next one. So.
yeah, thanks for watching. Until next time, train hard, y'all. Thank you. Do you have any other fitness questions that you're just dying to know the answer to? If so, please comment below and we will make it happen and we'll find the answers for you. Please consider subscribing and don't forget to click that little bell. You'll be the first to know whenever a new video comes out. Thanks for watching and until next time, train smart and train hard, y'all.